Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day, and before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's episode is sponsored by ARC Silver Gold Osmium. They offer personal service and often the lowest price, period, with no minimum purchase for silver, gold, platinum, or osmium. ARC SGO is available to discuss precious metals by email, phone, or in person at their retail location in Jackson, Wyoming, and they are committed to providing the best prices out there and making sure you get the best value and lowest premiums on their wide selection of products. Go to arcsgo.com and contact the owner, Ian Everard, at 307-264-9441 or ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And today's guest is a longtime Wall Street veteran, the author of Rigged to Fail and Gold Matters and a partner at Von Greyer's AG. It's Matthew Pippenberg. Great to have you back on the show. Great to be back, Jess. Looking forward to it. Yes, me as well. We were talking off camera before we hit record, and you had a lot on your mind today. So I'd love to unpack your thoughts on the broad market right now. You said it's obviously in a bubble. It's interesting. Most of the guests I have on the show would concur with that. There are a few outliers who say it's not a bubble. The American economy is actually much stronger than it looks. And it's just kind of the headline effect that people are seeing on social media, all of this negative information. But in reality, underneath, the engine of the American economy is actually strong. So I'm wondering how you would respond to that and your thoughts on the broad market and where it's headed. It's important to have different views, to your point. It's important to have different views. And in the gold industry, the precious metal space, there's plenty of room for exaggeration. We see it, you know, it sells clicks, it sells headlines, it seduces, um, you know, I respect that. I think the reality, as I said many times, I could be flogging bonds for a big bank, but I certainly don't believe in that. I, I have an actual conviction in real assets and in gold and silver in particular, but it's a fair question. We'll get into that. I mean, there's so many stovepipes we can go down this afternoon, but look, yes, we do have a very overvalued and concentrated stock bubble in the S&P. We have a liquidity crisis in the bond markets. We have a cornered Federal Reserve. We have a crashing commercial real estate market. And we have, again, in the backdrop of all this, debates about recession, inflation, the dollar. But to your point on this first question on the SMP, I would like to talk more about it because I don't think it's different this time. I think it is a classic bubble. I don't think the fundamentals on Main Street are strong, and we can get into that. I think, to your point, the bulls would say, look at our labor market look at our labor market, look at our stock market. What's there to worry about? Here comes another gold bug pushing a negative narrative. And I really want to respect that to take both sides of that debate and then hopefully try to answer that with facts rather than hyperbole, because I think the math, as I've said many times, we can all have different opinions and we're, you know, and who really knows? No one can say with absolute certainty that they know, but I think we deal with probabilities and we deal with math. We can all have different opinions, but we can't have different facts. And depending on which facts you really understand, including liquidity, bond markets, debt levels, interest rate policies, labor indicators, stock indicators, to me, there is absolutely nothing bullish about the Main Street economy other than the latest Bureau of Labor Statistics data, which is as bogus as our inflation data, quantifiably. So we can get into that. Wherever you want to start, we can start with the stock bubble, we can start with the recession, but you know, I think they're all worthy of debate, but certainly worthy of Let's pick our facts carefully. Let's agree on those and then draw your own conclusions. Everyone should. Yeah, well, let's start with the S&P, the NASDAQ continuing to grind to new all-time highs. So this is something that the bulls keep pointing to. Obviously, it's very dangerous to say this time is different. You know, you spoke that this seems like a classic bubble. This is straight out of Ben Graham's The Intelligent Investor, this massive overvaluation, a mania. Um However, Howard Marks has said 20% of the time, it really can be different, statistically speaking. So I'm wondering um, where you think the broad market is headed here. Do you think we continue to grind higher? Obviously, it's impossible to time things, but there's and, and there's a lot of people who kind of made their career on calling for a crash every single year until it finally happens. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts to the timing. Are we reaching critical mass at this point? I'll start by saying I don't know when. No one does. I think I know how. 
um, and to, you know, I'll try and take a bull and bear case to be fair and, and look at the, the different arguments. First of all, it's worth kind of disclosing that I was a hedge fund manager during the dot-com bubble, 98 to 2000, 2001, 2003, the whole NASDAQ circus. Many would say that this time is different. These are real companies today, the, the, the NVIDIAs, the Microsofts, uh, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, although Tesla and Apple have fallen out of the Magnificent Seven. They say these are real profit companies. These are based on fundamentals. This is a different kind of bubble. It's not like 2000. It's not like the dot-com. Um, and, you know, again, we can talk about that. But I have had not a theoretical exposure to bubbles, including the GFC in 2008, the MBS subprime bubble, and the dot-com bubble. I was there for both. Um, and I benefited from both. And it was a it was a shock to many when I was in Vancouver being interviewed, and they said, you know, because I'm a I'm a precious metals guy, I must be bearish. It's ab absolutely bullish right now in the stock market. And as bearish as I am, I have been bearish for years given these debt levels. But there are many golden bull opportunities in the risk asset markets, including March of 2020 when the S and P tanked by 30 percent, 36 percent, and the Fed announced unlimited QE. When you're getting a a tailwind from the Fed, take it. What's unique about this bubble and what's uniquely dangerous about this bubble is it is no different than 1998, 99, 2000. I'll, and, I'll, and I'll make my case as to why. I think the bulls would say, look, NVIDIA, profitable company. AI is different this time. Before, the internet was different this time. Now, AI is really different this time. These are really profitable companies. When you look at the balance sheets, in particular, NVIDIA leading the way, AI is a transitional new direction all the ai has been in the in the in the works for years this is nothing new but that's the narrative in my opinion and microsoft and these other companies are good well i will remind that fundamentals always drive bubbles and in fact during the dot-com bubble and i remember my bloomberg screen ticking away at, at you know names like cisco or qualcomm uh certainly microsoft even then which by the way microsoft has never recovered its highs from then but i'm saying you can have very profitable comp companies and, and then get a bubble because when there's profitable companies, of course, those are going to go up when they have advantages in, in cost and price and, you know, these margin advantages. So they can be very profitable. I remember watching in 1999 names like Qualcomm and Microsoft having very high profits, very high sales. Even in 2000, right before April when it tanked, they still had high sales, just less profits. So all bubbles begin with fundamentals. So in, in 2000, they were saying this isn't a bubble. This is, these are real companies. And they were real companies. They weren't bad companies. I'm not saying NVIDIA is going to go to zero and it's just a joke. When you look at the balance sheet of NVIDIA, you know, gosh, I think in 21, it went from 4 to $10 billion in profits and net income margins. The next year in 22, it lost $4 billion. This year, it's up to $19 billion in profits. Those are real profits. Can't argue with it. Can't say that NVIDIA is a bad company. What I am saying is it's an incredibly grotesquely overvalued company. And, and the way bubbles pop, like they did in 2000, uh, like I saw with Qualcomm and Microsoft and Cisco, is you do have an advantage in margins for a while. You have a price advantage. You have a cost advantage. You have a volume advantage. So when, when you see an expansion in net income margins, bubbles and fundamentals go up together. As the fundamentals go up, you get the spoof trading from the market makers and the hedge funds and the shadow banking. They put more money in to push the price. The retail plankton joins on with FOMO, fear of missing out. You get massive highs. A few smart prop desks in those days or traders today will know when the net margins start to trend from north to south, and then they'll start shorting. And that's how all bubbles pop, when net margins, net profit margins go from expansion to contraction. Most retail investors, most ETF buyers will not time that bottom or that turn. And, and you know, when I talk to a lot of hedge fund managers, because I was a hedge fund manager, I invested in hedge funds, hedge funds. <laughs> I talk to these PMs off the record, and I won't name any names, but of course they're going to ride this trend. CTAs are going to ride it. Momentum traders are going to ride it. Long short equity is going to ride it. But the difference is a few of those guys and gals actually know when to get out. And the, the truth is they will get out when those net margins start to, uh, to turn south. Most retail investors will not. So the FOMO now and the euphoria now is exciting. There's a fear of missing out. There's an opportunity cost. You want to get out of certain safe assets, go into this, get more return. But very few get out in time. Most get burned. That's been my personal experience, uh, and that's been the historical experience of bubbles. I've always said the retail investor is the plankton for Wall Street's whales. The other thing is many of these Wall Street insiders, these companies like Amazon, they pump these stocks up, sell their shares very quietly off the record, and take their profits on the momentum of retail investors. 
And then, and then the real opportunity though, for the guys I know is, yeah, they're going long now, but they're really loading their guns to go short because more money is made shorting bubbles than, than riding them and trying to time them. So that's my personal experience. Um, and that's my personal bias. I don't think this NVIDIA Magnificent 5 is any different than the super stocks that pushed me up in the dot-com bubble. What's also very dangerous about this bubble, regardless of your views on how AI is different than the internet euphoria of 2000 or 98, 99, the concentration risk. Again, the S&P is 33% tech. It's 33% market cap of five names. You could say seven, but it's really five now. That kind of concentration was very dangerous because it's the only thing holding these things up. Since 2021, all the other names on the S&P have been net negative. So you've got an S&P 5. That's not an exaggeration. That's not being bearish or pro-gold. That's just Let's just look at the facts. When you've got an S&P or a stock bubble driven by a small concentration of profitable names, when those net margins, when those profits go down, the entire S&P ETF, the entire package goes down with it. When that goes down the backdrop of a country that I consider already in recession, we could argue on the board of recession, when that goes down, when the market goes down, that good news story disappears. Then you've got labor, the other thing we can get into, well, that's a lagging indicator, but that goes down because earnings are down, layoffs are up, and then you have a debt crisis on top. So when this S&P goes down, what more good news do we have? And I hate to say it, all bubbles, and this is a bubble quantifiably, do one thing, they pop. No one can time when, they can just show you how they do it. So it's very risky to be a top chaser right now in the backdrop of a market rising, in the backdrop of so many fundamentally broken things, which we can get into. I think that's what makes this particular scary. And not only is it in the backdrop of a very broken US, which is on the border, and I'm the of you already in recession, unlike 2000 or 2008, the rest of the world wasn't equally dysfunctional. You've got recession now. I, I live in France, speak German, do interviews in German. There's a recession in Germany, folks, and your English-speaking audience, there's a recession. It's the third largest economy in the world. Its, economic, it's, it's Minister of Economics has said this is dramatically bad. Its PMI index is in depressionary levels. That's Germany. Japan, the UK, also in recession. South Korea and China, in recession. So when this bubble pops and the US tries to pretend we're okay and the rest of the world's in a recession, this is so much worse than 2000 or even 2008 because the dysfunction is not just local or dot com or MBS or subprime, it's global, it's everywhere. The only real positive narrative these days is this S&P bubble. I'd be very careful about trading it. I'd be even more careful about having a macro view that says this is proof that America is unique and immune from the realities of supply and demand, debt, liquidity, and other geopolitical realities. We're not in a vacuum. We're all interconnected. All this is verbunden. It's all connected. And so I think uh, you know, American or North or Western investors who aren't looking at the bigger picture are getting seduced by this narrative right now. I wouldn't blame them. Speculate. But there's huge risks in there. But the larger setting, the larger backdrop is incredibly dangerous. The concentration is dangerous. These five stocks will drive it up, but eventually they won't go to zero. They won't disappear, but they will grotesquely revert to their mean, which is what all bubbles do and all stocks do. Mean reversion is a power that should never be underestimated. I don't know the date. Like I said, when net margins, net incomes, and profits go from north to south and, and consistently stay that way, the bubble, the selling goes much faster than the buying. And then you're looking for liquidity in a market that has an exit door the size of a mouse hole. That's where you get burned. So be very careful if you want to speculate. I'm not here to say you shouldn't. I certainly benefited from speculating, but you got to be a big boy in that space. I'm not even myself anymore. I don't look at the Bloomberg every day. I'm not doing it myself. And very few portfolio managers that I know actually do it well, even then. So even the experts aren't always good at this. So yeah, long story short, it's a very dangerous bubble, very opportunistic, uh, certainly. And I said, the markets are Pavlovian. When the Fed gives you a tailwind, take it. Just the discussion of cutting rates in December by Powell is what created this bubble. That's what set it off. And I said in Vancouver, risk on in terms of equities because Powell just projected rate cuts. That was enough for the markets to get galvanic in the, and to rip. And then you put in the AI hysteria, you put in the NVIDIA story, you look at their profits, and boom, the mainstream media is just pushing this narrative. Again, tread very carefully, you top chasers out there. So what is your average retail investor out there to do in this sort of scenario? Because, you know, it seems like there's been a fundamental shift in the way the market is operating and the old strategy that's worked for the past decade of just 
putting your money dollar cost averaging into an S&P 500 index fund and calling it a day and feeling like a genius as the market keeps going up. It feels like those days seem to be over. Is this a time to sit in short-term treasuries and money market accounts? Um, is there any areas of the market you currently currently see opportunity in? Obviously, we don't give investment advice here, but if if you were a retail investor with, let's say, 100 grand, how how would you deploy that capital in this market today? We could talk about that's a very important question. Obviously, your listeners obviously want to know, and uh, without giving specific names, as you said in the, in the caveat at the beginning. Look, first of all, simple, stupid. We were all told by our parents and grandparents to buy low and sell high. Nobody does it. I, we've all been part of the FOMO train, that fear of missing out, that momentum. Uh, and, and it's easy to catch a train. It's hard to get off of one when it's turning the other direction. I think, first of all, be very, very careful when you're buying the top. Let's admit it. No one knows the top and no one knows the bottom. We all know what it feels like when we're in one. Clearly, we're in a top. You know, um, I'm not saying just get out of the markets. If I'd said that 10 years ago, even as bearish as I was on debt, there are opportunities to go long. This is clearly nearing a top. Everyone says it's the top. We said it two years ago. I could say it a year ago. Well, certainly not in 2022. It was a brutal market. When the Fed gives you a tail, when it's going to go up, when, they're gonna, when they say they're going to cut rates or they actually cut rates, or if they pivot to QE, the markets will go up, um, but then they will mean revert. To your specific question, it's not even a question of what positions. The the standard risk parity portfolio I warn, I've been warning for years, they work in bull markets, uh, the stock bonds, because stocks and bonds are highly correlated. Um, that 60, 40, 70, 30 ratio of equities, broad equities to broad, uh, 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 credits is extremely dangerous when we get into a bull cycle, a uh, bear cycle. And again, no one can time it. The signals are when profit net profit margins go south, uh, and then trying to get exit when you can. But I, I would argue to your second question, first of all, be very careful if you're heavy, top heavy right now and, and overpriced, overvalued, concentrated, uh, equities. Be very careful of thinking bonds are a safe haven or a hedge to your equity portfolio because bonds and stocks are now correlated. They're both bubble assets. So 60-40 or 70-30 isn't a hedge portfolio. It's just a concentrated portfolio. And, and the reason I can say that, um, obviously, you can get better yield on the short end of the yield curve. If you're going to be in credits, be on the short end of the yield curve. And, and not just saying that because everyone's saying that. Look at the facts. This is not my dad's your dad's or my grandfather's bond market. It just isn't. These even sovereign bonds are not safe. Junk bonds are not safe. Corporate bonds are not safe. But even the risk-free return, or I would call the return-free risk of a US 10-year or 20-year is not going to save you. Um, look at the 20-year auction just recently. The 20-year auction, uh, nobody showed up in the foreign markets. Again, this goes to the larger narrative of no one trusting the US Treasury, Uncle Sam's IOU, down 20% from November in terms of foreign buyers. That's not an exaggeration. That's a fact. Again, we can all have our own opinions. That's a fact. There's 20% less interest in US 20 years. Um, that is usually a sign that there's distrust for that. That means the price is going to continue to go down unless primary dealers, the banks, which the Fed forces to buy, these unwanted, unloved IOUs steps in. So you have a clearly unloved IOU as evidenced by the 20-year Treasury just last week. That's a fact. We also have a fact that since 2014, foreign central banks are net sellers of US Treasuries and net buyers of gold. That's not a gold bug argument. It's just a fact. There's a reason we're seeing year after year of dumping Uncle Sam's IOUs and stacking physical gold. It's not a bias. That's a reality. So you've got that. Then you've got the Congressional Budget Office, which in its Q1 deficit report already showed enough spending that we're running at an annualized rate of $2.2 trillion in deficits. That's a fact. That's a grotesque number. Another fact, again, draw your own conclusions, 8.9 trillion of US treasuries have to be repriced this year. They're coming to maturity. 8.9 trillion this year. Who's going to buy the next round or the next wave of IOUs from Uncle Sam? When they come to maturity at a higher rate, if Powell keeps rates higher for longer, even if he cuts them by 25 or 50 basis points, that becomes painfully expensive for Uncle Sam to pay his own his own interest rate, his own interest expense. That's just a fact. So that means we've got 8.9 trillion coming mature in just U.S. Treasuries, U.S. sovereign Treasuries. The Congressional Budget Office just said that our unfunded liabilities, Medicaid and Social Security, are going to run out of money in 2030. That's assuming we don't have a recession, and that's pricing in 
a 3% GDP or a 3 to 4% debt to GDP ratio, that's incredibly optimistic. So we've got 100 and I think, I think it's like 100, I know, 212 trillion in unfunded liabilities and 190 in assets. It's just a fact. We are illiquid. We are broke. We're going to have to come up with new ways to create liquidity. That's going to be more IOUs, more bonds, more sovereign bonds. The problem is no one wants them. It's just a fact. So our bond market is going to have less and less natural demand, but we have to keep issuing IOUs. This is just a fact. Our Congressional Budget Office says in the next 10 years, another $20 trillion in IOUs are going to be issued. The problem is, the rub is, no foreign buyers. Who's going to buy it? Sorry, I don't see any other way out. It's going to be the Fed. And how are they going to pay for that? With synthetic liquidity created by a mouse click at the central bank, at the Eccles building. This is not gloom and doom bearish to be bearish. This is math and fact and debt. The mismatch is grotesque, the supply and the demand, since there is a clear indication that our weaponized, distrusted U.S. dollar and U.S. Treasury is no longer what it used to be 20 years ago, 10 years ago. We're going to have to resort to what Luke Roman calls super QE to monetize our own debt. That is going to be inherently inflationary. That's going to debase the dollar, and that, that's how it all affects. But that bond market is going to see so much volatility. We're already seeing it. We saw volatility. People's memories are short. Just last year, the three sigma moves on the short end of the yield curve. This year, we're seeing a liquidity crisis in the bond market. Last year, we saw it. The Fed has to keep the bond market alive. That's that's its mandate. It's not just inflation and employment. It's the big banks and the bond markets. And so since we live off of IOUs as a nation, if no one else is buying them, the Fed will have to do it. To do that, we're going to have to create synthetic liquidity. For the last couple of years, in fact, for the last four years, the Fed has had what I call backdoor liquidity. It's like QE by another name. We've used the BTFP program. We've taken money out of the TGA accounts. We've used the reverse repo markets. Yellen's been pushing IOUs out of the short end, at the short end of the yield curve. Now she's trying at the 20 or at the long end. They're so desperately trying to issue more, I promise you, more, I promise you, IOUs, but less and less demand. So they bought time between the yin and the yang of Powell trying to tighten while Yellen is loosening through the yield curve, through issuance on the long and the short end, through the TGA, the Treasury General Account, through the reverse repos, all of which are all drying up right now. Again, if you think of liquidity as the grease that keeps the car moving, we keep running out of grease. That car's warning lights keep going on four or five times. Every time, immediately, the, the, Treasury, the Treasury Department or the Fed try to put in some form of liquidity through all these tricks. Eventually, it's going to be full-time QE, like we saw in 2020. Don't know when, but that engine's already stalling, going to the side of the road because we have no grease. We have no natural liquidity coming from foreign markets for our treasuries. And so that's a very long-winded way of saying bonds aren't going to be as safe as you thought they were. There's going to be a lot of volatility. Junk bonds, again, aren't very safe. Corporate bonds aren't very safe. So everyone's trying to find yield, but there's no place to go. When you're in a bubble, great. If you can get out in time, great. If you if you can go on the short end of the yield curve, great. That'll give you some yield. I don't think it really beats actual inflation, but you got to do something. Personally, I like commodities in general, uh, but there's still a lot of great value in commodities. There's still great value in gold and silver, still 52-week highs. But again, it doesn't mean when you compare gold to the in ratio to the money supply, it's as cheap today as it was in 1971. You know, you can still get good value. But when you're looking at NVIDIA or you're hearing that the AI is going to save the world, I don't blame people to chase that and get the quicker returns faster. They're just more likely to get burned. But again, bonds aren't what they used to be. Currencies aren't what they used to be. And equities are overvalued. And it's just dangerous. But you know, the Fed and the, and the markets are at a mismatch right now. The Fed is cornered. The market's overvalued. They're risky. But you can chase them if you want. But again, I, I say with, with tremendous, tremendous uh, carefulness and uh, eyes open, I hope. Well, let's shift to discussing gold specifically for a moment here. Uh, last time you were on, we we talked quite in depth about it, so I'd love to hear an update on your current views. Um, I had Alistair McLeod on recently. He pointed to the fact that there's going to be 200 BRICS meetings uh, this year alone, leading up to a meeting in October. He thinks a lot of this could be around trying to get a gold-backed currency uh, established for trade between the BRICS nations. He even pointed to the fact that he believes Russia could be looking to go back onto a gold standard. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, uh, first of all, on, on the BRICS nations and their potential move towards using gold. 
And you described a lot of very alarming situations. Do you think the end result of all of this could be gold in some form or another returning to the monetary system? It's absolutely already happening. You know, and it's an incredibly important point. Alice is incredibly brilliant on, on credit markets, banks, currencies. I agree with a lot of what, how can I disagree? Um, when in Vancouver, I was on a panel with Andy Sheckman and Rick Rule and Grant Williams. We've all agree on the de-dollarization reality. Again, it's not hyperbole. It's not hyperbole. And what Alistair is saying is not hyperbole. He's been looking at Glasiev and Bobokov and the eventual idea of a of a gold-backed currency. I don't think we need a gold-backed currency for the world to go to gold, but that's an, an interesting point. The de-dollarization theme and the gold-backed theme and the role of gold are all intertwined. As, as I said in, in, in Vancouver uh, and with Andy and Grant and, and Rick and some clearly some clever people who we all agree though on this that the de-dollarization is no longer a debate it's a reality it's important to keep it in mind in terms of timing and pace as i said then um you know to brent johnson's credit look 80 percent of world you know trade is still settled in u.s dollars the swift system is still massively predominant the euro dollar market the derivative market 85 percent of fx transactions last year all in u.s dollar we're not saying the u.s dollar goes away or that its world reserve currency status disappears this year. It's happening faster than I would believe just two years ago when we weaponized the dollar with Putin. The speed is happening fast. The de-dollarization is now undeniable. And the implications we're all speculating on, but you can't deny the simple fact that more than 45 countries now are trading bilateral agreements outside the dollar. You can't deny the fact that 20% of last year's oil sales oil sales, that's incredibly important, were outside of the U.S. dollar. That is devastating to the U.S. dollar. You can't deny the fact that BRICS countries can, or Russia, you know, can sell oil to China and China will buy it and yuan that Russia can then convert into gold in the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Why do they want gold for the yuan? Because they want gold like every other central bank, because they no longer believe that 10 years from now, the U.S. dollar is going to be the most liquid tier one asset. Even the Bank of International Settlements last year made gold a tier one asset. And again, this is not to be a gold bug. Look at the facts. The world, the central banks of the world are net long stacking physical gold and dumping U.S. treasuries. I said there, and I'll say it again now, it's like Robert E. Lee marching his army from Virginia into Maryland on his way to Antietam or Sharpsburg or Gettysburg. You don't need to be a military genius when you see the cavalry, the pickets, the scouts, and the infantry marching across the Potomac heading your way something's changing. When you see central banks marching towards gold and marching away from U.S. treasuries, the world is changing. Doesn't mean the war is over or the battle's over, but we're seeing tectonic shifts, as we said in Vancouver, in the trust and use of the U.S. dollar. But it's important also to say that that dollar, like, get, like the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee or Napoleon, doesn't die easily. It takes more than a headline or a clickbait headline to say that the world reserve currency is over. But the, is to Rick Rule's point, the hegemony is still there. The supremacy is not. And so the world is stacking gold and dumping treasuries and getting away from the U.S. dollar because that dollar, which has been dethroned since 1971 without gold, and its inflation exported to all over the world and bullied every country from Venezuela to Germany to Japan to China and Russia and now weaponized against Putin just doesn't have the same trust. And to Alistair's point, well, what is the dollar backed by? Full faith and trust in the U.S. Treasury, in the U.S., but no one has full faith and trust. And his argument is essentially, as Russia has been saying for years, eventually we've got to move to a gold-backed currency. Again, highly important, debatable point. My argument is they don't need a gold-backed currency to have gold net settled uh, their transactions. They don't need a gold-backed currency to basically have gold become more and more predominant in the net settlement of trades. And what I mean by that is, look, many of these countries in the BRICS don't fully trust each other. They just don't trust America at all or the U.S. dollar and its IOU, but they do trust gold. And they don't want to give up their own sovereign right to print as much local currency as they want to stay in power. But when it comes to trading and settling, they do trust gold. So even without a gold-backed currency that could be redeemable at, say, a central bank in Russia or a China, they can just transact in dollars but hold in gold and go through the Shanghai Gold Exchange and other exchanges. And gold is slowly becoming that tier one asset that the BIS gave it credit for. It's happening anyway. 
And even like, again, with the petrodollar, you take away the petrodollar. I'm not saying that's happening tomorrow, but it is happening. Again, 20% of oil sold outside of the U.S. dollar. If we had mentioned that three years ago, they'd think you were a conspiracy theorist or a kook or crazy. And Saudi Arabia and the UAE are still pegged to the U.S. dollar. Why would they want to kill the dollar? Well, they're not going to kill it yet until they have plenty of gold. And they're still going to trade in dollars because it's liquid. But to Alistair's point, they are... Death by a thousand cuts. And Andy Sheckman's right too. Death by a thousand cuts. They're slowly moving away from the dollar. To Brent Johnson's point, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think it's happening faster than Brent wants to believe. I think the geopolitics and the reality of money and the reality of uh, foreign policy, these are all happening at such an incredible pace. You can no longer deny the trend away from the dollar. You can no longer deny the power of the BRICS plus partnerships. The fact that Saudi Arabia and the UAE are even in there now it's extraordinary. I don't think it requires a gold-backed BRICS currency in the next few years for gold to just do very, very well. And again, the fact that central banks are stacking at such levels is to me, take gold, take my Swiss position, take my bias out of it. Just look at what the world's doing. It's fairly obvious. That doesn't mean Bitcoin can't make a lot of money. doesn't mean NVIDIA can't make a lot of money. It doesn't mean the only thing you should be in is gold. There's def definitely a lot of reasons why uh, I think you should be in gold, but your question about Alistair, the gold back, the bricks, the de-dollarization, you can't ignore the reality of that. It's really a fine point to debate um, whether it's a gold back bricks currency or just gold becoming more and more predominant. And I think, again, I don't need to make fun of Alistair. I think he's onto a lot of things with what he's tracking there with Glasiev and Bobakov and this need. But gold just becomes supreme anyway. And I, you know, I had a long debate with Brent Johnson on the DXY and the US dollar. And we can have totally different views, but we both agree on gold. It's the ultimate end game. I watched um, Rick Rule, and that was Rick Rule. It was Peter Schiff and uh, Larry Leopard, who I really like. Larry Leopard defending Bitcoin. Peter Schiff, of course, trying to poo poo Bitcoin. But they both agree on gold. So we're going to have different views on the DXY or Bitcoin versus gold. I personally am not anti Bitcoin, but I'm saying, all of us could have these debates, but what we all agree on is that gold is the end game because that's what the commercial banks are doing. That's what 5,000 years of history have shown. Doesn't mean Bitcoin is a joke and it doesn't mean gold's a pet rock. But again, gold is certainly a part of my portfolio. And Alistair's point about the, the, the gold backing doesn't, to me, require an actual currency redeemable by one particular BRICS nation. It just has to be more and more involved in net trade, trade settlements, which we're already seeing all the time now. Silver has not been declared a tier one asset. It is also not being accumulated by central banks. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are there. It's been a very frustrating trade for, uh, you know, silver stackers in general. I think the silver squeeze movement uh, kind of brought a lot of people into the trade that believed they're going for a ride like this was going to be GameStop and, and it did not go in the direction they thought. Um, a metal that's very far off of its all time highs what what are your thoughts on silver here? It's it's not viewed as money in the same way as gold is on, on the international level. We're talking about when we talk about the BRICS nations and this move towards gold and and oil being transacted with gold, it, it, et cetera. So what is silver's role in all of this? Again, as Egon often says, it's not for widows and orphans. It's more volatile. It's that little speedboat, whereas gold is that juggernaut. It's the battleship that carves you through all the sturm and drang of the geopolitics and the debt realities and the market volatility and the paucity of good financial leadership and financial policy. Gold just keeps powering through. And, and yet, gold doesn't move in a straight line. Silver, though, when gold really does break through, and we can talk why I think gold will break through significantly in the next few years, regardless if it doesn't go in a straight direction. When gold really does rip through, silver is like that little speedboat. And that's why it's more volatile. It's more of a speculative asset, it's still a monetary metal. You know, Rick Rule, I think, probably said it best. And I'm not an apologist for silver. People have been hearing every year, this is the year. The, the ratios are going to you know, I'm not here to tell you, oh, it's because of Indian demand, or it's because wholesale demand, or it's because the European refiners are tight. They have no more gold, uh, silver left. It's this year. It's going to rip. It may. I don't know. But as Rick Rule said, and, and you got to keep this in mind, your, your investment horizon, if you're an investor as opposed to a speculator in precious metals, has to be long and patient. But as Rick Rule said, silver rewards extravagantly, but infrequently. And for the silver stackers, I can understand some of them. I wish I was in Bitcoin, man. I'd be up 50%. What am I doing with this silver? Again, I get it. I'm not here to apologize for it. 
Bitcoin, for a lot of reasons, has some real headwinds and tailwinds that silver doesn't have. I don't know if I have time to get into that. But again, if you're an investor, you're agnostic. I mean, I have clients in 90 countries. No one calls me and asks me about the gold price or the silver price. Not one of them. And these are high net worth investors. You'd be surprised who some of them are. They don't care because they just see the long game. I realize that a lot of your audience doesn't have the patience or the they need liquidity now or they need something to happen now because things are really tough. I'm not trying to be disparaging of that. But if you're an investor and you hold silver, you do have to be you have to be very patient and the rewards will be extravagant because gold will I mean, gold will move, but silver will rip. The question is, like in any asset, though, is what's the top or what's the ratio where you sell or where you continue to hold? That's up to each individual investor. But um, no, there is a strong case to be made with both gold and silver, as we're seeing, you know, open interest outflows in the COMEX right now, 40 million ounces just out, out of the gold market, for example, in the COMEX. Most of it going to the to chase this concentrated, now centralized ETF for uh, Bitcoin. I'm fine with that. Anti-fiat, they're leaving the comics. It's actually very, very good for gold and silver because all this levered fiat gold in the comics and the LBMA markets in London, now these levered parties, these counterparties, really have to come up with delivery to get these outflows, these net outflows. They don't have enough physical gold. So when all this money goes into Bitcoin to chase this top, to chase this bubble, and Bitcoin may not be a bubble, we can get into that. That means there's going to be less physical gold in the COMEX, less physical silver in the COMEX, as Andy Sheckman and others have said better than me. There's just no physical gold and silver there. And when this euphoria comes back to reality, uh, the COMEX is going to come up with some gold fast, and they can't lever it after Basel III. So there is so many setups fundamentally, geopolitically, and just historically for gold and silver. And again, gold has still outperformed the S&P since 2000. It's still out. It's going to outperform the U.S. dollar because any fiat currency is going to underperform gold if you hold it for the right reasons. You know, wealth preservation and insurance against everything that's broken right now, except for the S&P, it can't outperform that. That's for sure. But if you're an investor and you're into wealth preservation, these aren't sales phrases. These are fundamental understandings of why you own precious metals. If you're a speculator, gold is not sexy. Silver will be sexier, but it certainly isn't sexy right now. And I get the impatience. But I do agree with Rick because Rick, like Ross Beatty and these longtime legends like Egon von Greyers, they're not investing for the, the you know the, the time span of six months or six years. They're 10, 12, 15 years. They're trying to think of generational wealth or 10, 12 bag returns without the volatility, the FOMO and the nonsense of the mainstream media or the central banks or all the market makers and the salesmen on the street. They're just thinking quietly long-term. So many smart, very successful investors think the same way. That doesn't mean they have 100% of their wealth in gold or silver, but they see it as a far more stable way to get that 10 bagger, et cetera, by being patient. And kind of being agnostic as to this crazy headlines right now and not being seduced. Again, if you can afford to take risks, chase these tops if you want. Take some profits if you can, if you can get out in time. I'm not against it. I, I did very well speculating, but I was also very lucky that I got out in time. Wasn't smart. Um, but uh, again, when you're thinking of gold and silver, strong case to be made is there's, there's a very tight supply of silver. There's ra rapidly growing demand in India and in the wholesale markets and the refiners are running out of actual supply. That is huge price pressure to the north for silver. And the manipulation that happens on the COMEX and the LBMA is now being pushed towards manipulating Bitcoin's price range and not gold and silver. And other things are happening because there's now a, a yuan-based gold exchange and a yuan-based oil exchange that the attention from trying to manipulate gold is now going elsewhere. And the need for gold is now increasing as a tier one asset among central banks. So the ultimate long-term trend is gold has nowhere to go but up, never in a straight line. But compared to bubble assets, which go up and then tank, gold's not going to behave that way. And silver will rip when gold when gold climbs. That's my view. And it's my it's the view of many equity traders, bond traders, and others who are clients of us who hold their own personal money in gold, even though they're trading and speculating in risk assets. Again, depends on your, your profile, depends on what you're trying to do this week or this year or the next 10 years with your money. If it's preservation, it's nothing better. If it's liquidity, the dollar in the stock market, risky, but go for it. Not trying to make fun of speculation. Just separate which one you are, an investor from a speculator. And I'm certainly not going to defend that silver 
is done just fine when everyone's waiting for it to get to the multiples and to get to that ratio that it hasn't gotten to yet. And I don't have the answer. No one does. I see a lot more signs now, though, that we're getting closer. But even gold, when markets rip and then they pop, gold can go down with markets for a short period of time. We cannot deny that reality either. It's very sympathetic to falling markets because people need to make their margins or get liquidity. When, when gold is the only safe asset, sadly, when you've been burned in risk assets, you need to get your liquidity from your only safe asset. So again, but the long-term direction of gold for me, it's, it's, it's best days aren't even begun. It's only in the second chapter of a very long book. And the weaponization of the dollar, the, the, the grotesque over-leverage of the U.S. Treasury, the, the, the broken nature of liquidity in the U.S. markets and in the bond market, the unloved nature of the U.S. Treasury, the dumping of it by central banks, um, all of these things point to a world clearly moving away from the dollar and away from the IOUs of the U.S. Treasury and towards physical real assets in general and precious metals in particular and gold specifically. That is not a gold bug argument. That is absolutely happening right before our very eyes. And are there any other areas of the market that you're currently looking at that you think are interesting? Emerging markets, any other non-U.S. markets? Um energy? Is there anything that's catching your eye right now as a, an investment that could be interesting moving forward? Well, I think in a global recession, everything gets hurt. I think emerging markets are going to have great value opportunity. We talked about that. Mexico, India have the, have the demographics. Doesn't mean they're going to move in a straight line from here. There's going to be a global recession that has an impact on commodity cycles. But when we come through that, and God knows how and when, it won't be tomorrow, uh, it'll be a super cycle for commodities in general, and that'll kick off in the emerging markets. The other area, obviously, you can't den deny the energy market. When you see a WAN-based oil market, you know, a CNY oil exchange, when you see a CNY gold exchange and a CNY gold oil ratio, that's going to put tremendous pressure. Uh, against the U.S. dollar and, and positive for gold, because now you can't have two separate gold markets and two separate gold prices. You can't have the COMEX, the London, New York markets saying one thing, while the Chinese Shanghai Gold Exchange is saying something else. Now the West has lost its control of that. Thanks to weaponizing the dollar, thanks to the Putin sanctions that backfire, China and Russia are doing exactly what they wanted to do, which is create a fair, more fundamentals-based gold price. Um, so I think you know, that's undeniable. I think emerging markets will be interesting. I certainly think India and Mexico are interesting demographically. I think the oil trade is absolutely essential to watch because it's tied to the gold trade, but it's more importantly, it's tied to the dollar trade, the rates trade. But again, when you're moving away from a petrodollar, that was the demand. When, when Nixon welched on the dollar in 71, Kissinger was out trying to get OPEC to use the dollar to buy oil. So there'd be natural synthetic demand for now a basically an oil back dollar. And, 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 and Volcker had to raise rates very high to keep the Saudis interested in a gold back petro and a dollar back petrodollar. Well that that can't be done anymore. That dollar and that treasury aren't so sexy to Saudi Arabia and the UAE anymore. That's why they're doing more trade Saudi Arabia is doing more trade with China than they are with the US and Europe combined. You can't ignore these realities. There is a move away from the dollar. When that move becomes slow and then fast, the demand for that dollar without that petrodollar support, that's what killed Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein. You can't do that to, to the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. There is now no denying that the U.S. is losing its control over that petrodollar. Again, not tomorrow, not today, but you got to be thinking that hockey stick or that hockey puck, or I say the polo ball, you play it four plays ahead, not the first backswing. So if you're an investor, the trends are obvious here. I feel so safe in an anti-dollar asset, like commodities in general, or gold in particular. But the other thing in terms of a local market that we haven't talked about, I know this is going on, but it's, we got to hit it because it's so important, is commercial real estate. When you're talking about, we started with an SMP asset bubble. We remember how asset bubbles pop when net margins go. But also, behind every crisis is a liquidity crisis. And behind every crisis is a banker who screwed something up. What we're seeing now isn't the repeat of subprime residential mortgage-backed securities, but what we're seeing is CRE, commercial real estate, bad underwriting, bad loans, bad liquidity. And again, it's not just New York Community Bank here. These small banks, many of these small banks are 30% exposed to non-performing commercial real estate loans. Those loans are tanking. New York Commodity uh, Community Bank was based on two bad loans. That was enough to take its stock market price down 30%, 40% in a day. And then the next day, just get tanked. But New York Community Bank is not alone. And even the big, too big to fail banks have huge exposure. And those NPLs, those non-performing loans are now greater than their loss reserves. They'll be bailed out by the Fed. But I'm not saying that the CRE crisis is going to be the next subprime crisis like 2008. But when you look at that 
clearly developing period right now. And it's like Reinhardt and Rogoff said, bad lending, debt crisis, bank consolidations, bank failures. You know, you can't deny that these risks are in the backdrop of rising S&P. So it's not a good story when banks are now squeezed and, and the smaller banks are going to consolidate and fail. That story is not over. The The regional bank crisis that started last year in 2023 is not over. That's an incredibly dangerous sign. And the labor market is not as strong as they say. We didn't have time. We don't have time to go into all of that. But again, they're offering 200,000 new jobs. They're ignoring the 1.4 million in that same period. They're just gone. They're ignoring the 700,000 are now part-time. Again, bearish facts. Am I just being bearish to be bearish? No, I'm trying to put all the facts out there. That is not a sign of a strong economy. That is just manipulation of labor data, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics does just like they do with inflation. Every smart guy on Wall Street knows it's a bogus. It's a bogus lie, but it's the it's never right, but it's always correct because it's the official number. That's what the markets trade off of. Right now, the headlines and the Fed is using words that replace bad math. They need a strong labor story, but the labor story isn't strong. But even if it were, it's a lagging indicator. All three other recessionary indicators are there, except for a market bubble. That's what we're positive about, another market bubble that couldn't come at a worse time. So it's a lot in there, Jesse. But it's like, again, yes, I'm incredibly bearish. Doesn't mean I'm not bullish in certain sectors, including the S&P. But the macros, never seen a macro environment this bad, not just in the U.S. with the most unprecedented debt levels and illiquidity problems I have ever seen, studied or traded. But in the entire global setting, everything is dysfunctional. The world's in recession, and the U.S. apparently is immune from that. Keep this in mind. Despite everything we've talked about, the bond markets and junk bonds and currencies and rates and recession indicators and liquidity versus illiquidity, or gold versus silver, keep in mind, Germany, Japan, U.K., China, South Korea, they're all in recession right now. The largest economies in the world are in recession, and we're what? We're waiting for the S&P to save us? We're waiting for the U.S. dollar to save us. We're waiting for the BRICS to get back into the dollar, for Putin to forget about being sanctioned, for peace when our policymakers are pushing for war. There's just nothing very positive about these facts. And it's not even really something to smile about. It's just comically tragical that we're even debating hard versus soft landing when you look at all the other indicators, which we spend hours on. So again, uh it's a lot thrown at you, Jesse, but there's just so many things broken. And what, labor and the stock market are strong? Neither are strong. The stock market's concentrated into five names, and labor market's as bogus as the 42nd Street Rolex, in my opinion. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Matthew. Extremely enlightening conversation. Always love picking your brain. Um, for those who want to learn more, could you tell us about Von Grayer's AG? And for people who want to hear more from you, where's the best place to go? Is it your books? Is there somewhere online they can go? Yeah, I mean, our website, our old website was goldswitzerland.com. You can still find us on goldswitzerland.com. You can also find us on vongreyers.gold or vg.gold. We've just revamped the website after naming our company from Matterhorn Asset Management after our founder and chairman, uh, Egon Von Grayers, who obviously is still very much a part in driving the ship, but we thought it was the time um, to put his name on the masthead really in, for the next generation of our team to, and the generations to come to, to homage it in that way. Our website's been recently uh, highly updated to have a whole section on objective arguments on why to own gold, how not to own gold, in particular, how not to hold it in an ETF how not to hold it a commercial bank, what jurisdictions are safer than others. So it's a really good, I think, very objective case for physical gold and what jurisdictions to hold in. We have strong biases for Switzerland and Singapore. They're not perfect, but they're better than any other place we can think of, uh, far better than the Caymans or Panama or you know other jurisdictions that we don't believe in. Um, and we give the reasons why, but there's a strong page on just why gold, but you can find all our articles and interviews with Egon and myself, Egon von Greyers, on uh, bg.gold and uh, like i said there's a huge section there that's really more about just the arguments not just why gold but how to own it and where to own it those are very important factors to consider as well and all our arguments there and our services obviously is to keep gold away from the banking system keep it outside of your own jurisdiction for you know keep it legal but keep it outside of your own you know create a firewall between you and your own government in a legal setting in a legal vault with no counterparty risk so again I think for many who come to us, they already get why they need to own physical precious metals. What we have done better than anyone, I think, in our industry is show you how and where. And uh, that's really got to be more discussed, I think, too, is you know, once you understand physical precious metals, you got to understand the safest way to hold it. Absolutely. Well, I'll put a link in the description below for people to check that out. 
Thank you once again, Matthew, for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge with the audience. It's my pleasure. Couldn't stop me from talking. It was a lot to talk about. So thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by Arc Silver Gold Osmium. Visit their website at arcsgo.com and contact the owner, Ian Everard, today at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com to get the best prices out there and make sure to tell them Commodity Culture sent you. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.